Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, our webinar, um, High Speed Journey to Net Zero. So it sounds all very exciting. How do new infrastructure projects get to this um, very challenging goal? Uh, my name is Maria and um, I'm a director at eTool, um, the company that specializes in lifecycle assessment and providing software eTool LCD. Um, this webinar is hosted by eTool um, and we have a very special guest, um, Mark Fenton, uh, who is our guest speaker and he's joining us today from uh, the UK. Um, Mark Fenton is a um, uh, carbon manager at the project HS2, a high speed to, uh, this is an organization that delivers um, the largest infrastructure project in Europe um, and the UK's new uh, high speed railway. Um, Mark is responsible for uh, developing the programs BAS 2080 carbon management system and implementing HS2's net zero carbon plan. Uh, to facilitate um, carbon minimization and um, reporting, it will software has been approved by HS2 and is being used across uh, various phases of the project, has been used for uh, a few years already. Now, um, before we start, um, I would like to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are joining uh, here from Australia. Uh, I would like to pay my respect to their elders past and um, present. So during uh, today's uh, 60 minutes webinar, I will uh, briefly introduce uh, eTool company and our software to those who haven't heard of uh, us before. Uh, then uh, Mark will introduce uh, the project HS2 and their carbon management approach, as well as speak about what methods and tools uh, they use to measure targets and the circularity. And finally, um, he'll also talk about the new net zero carbon plan um, that um, HS2 project has committed to net zero by 2035. And uh, he'll explain what it means to um, subcontractors as well as all our project teams. And we will have about 20 minutes time um, to answer your questions. So please um, write them down. Um, there is a button um, where uh, the questions uh, so feel free to put these questions down there so when the time will come uh, we will uh, have some time to answer them right let's begin uh, and um, first of all I'd like to introduce uh, eTool and um, uh, our software um, I'm sure some of you heard of eTool um, it's um, it's an Australian uh, small tech company but with a very big mission and with very passionate people behind um, Rich and Alex are uh, founders and the principals of eTool and um, our company's mission is to help you to reduce the construction, to uh, decarbonize and reduce CO2 uh, of your construction projects. So we provide uh, software eTool LCD uh, to optimize whole of life uh, carbon as well as costs of construction projects. Um, this could be projects of buildings but also infrastructure of all kinds. Okay, now um, let me tell you a bit more about um, our software, eTool LCD. By the way, um, so eTool company is called eTool and uh, our software is called eTool LCD. And there's also reason behind it. Uh, we wanted to call it uh, eTool LCD because we like lifecycle design. Uh, because this is exactly where you still have a chance to reduce emissions and um, create a change. So eTool software is, um, is a design tool basically. And today I'd like you to remember and take away two things about eTool software. Um, so one is that it's a design software and the second one is that um, it's a collaboration portal. So let's now quickly talk through these features um, of the design uh, software. Um, so first of all, we uh, we help to uh, measure carbon from materials, water, energy uh, throughout the life of the project from the start to finish, or it's called cradle to grave, um, following the LCA methodology and standards. Um, and um, the second feature is that um, dealing with so much information, you, you want to have some quick upload of this information. So we integrate it with Revit uh, and Beam and uh, there's also options to upload CSV file so that the modeling is a bit faster. 
Um, the third feature that I really like is lifecycle cost analysis as well, um, because of course it's extremely important to reduce carbon, but uh, often uh, projects have very limited budget, so we need to make sure that uh, we achieve uh, the best environmental performance at the lowest cost possible. Um, and the last feature that I'd like to mention is um, automated reports. So when um, the user has completed modeling, they can simply press the button and uh, generate automated report that can be used for different um, submissions for gray, uh, green um, rating schemes. Um, and the second feature is that it's a collaboration portal. So we, we really need to collaborate to reduce carbon and for such large projects as HS2. Um, it's essential to work with uh, the design teams uh, and uh, work on uh, innovative solutions, uh, share the knowledge, uh, work out on benchmarks and um, use a platform to not only reduce but also measure, report um, and manage this carbon uh, and understand where this whole journey goes to. So um, now let me jump into the software and actually show you how it looks uh, like. I hope you can see my screen. Um, so basically it's a cloud-based uh, platform and um, it's, it's the same as I said before, it's a design tool but also uh, a collaboration tool. So if you think uh, horizontally you may have different assets um, that each have different design and scenarios and options uh, and you also want to report across the whole assets and portfolio. So um, you have the ability to report on emissions and uh, cumulative uh, greenhouse gas savings across um, the whole program, as well as you can collaborate with uh, different users. And this could be um, external, but also internal organizations that dial in, log into the software, to the same platform and then get access to particular projects and or models and then um, conduct the modeling and um, provide uh, consulting. Um, and so when you would then uh, want to look at different uh, projects uh, and how this, this is done, um, for example, uh, elevated station and rail, um, and I have different um, design options here. So business as usual and low carbon design. Um, so if I open them separately um, to look what it consists of, you would then see the total carbon footprint of that project um, and, um, and then for a low carbon design it's the same project but with a low carbon option um, you can also see it has a lesser emissions. So uh, how do we get there? We can model it all in detail and also provide uh, a list of recommendations um, that helps to very accurately um, quantify every single decision that your design team uh, puts forward uh, and understand how much carbon that decision will help you to avoid um, if this project will, is built. So it's very um, flexible at the same time gives you that transparency and, um, and strict framework on how these emissions are reported. So um, go back to the presentation now and um, give you a few examples of um, where um, where it was software has been used in, in this full power. Um, so the first one is in uh, Australia, um, actually public transport authority in uh, WA um, that um, uh, is using e tool as well. Um, their uh, sustainability strategy um, of the Metronet um, has recognized the power of LCA and LCC for planning and, um, and integrated LCA into planning. So in other words, um, so every single project needs to undergo LCA and LCC assessment uh, from the very early stage of design and then update those models throughout design process to make sure that um, the, the project will achieve the best environmental and um, economic performance. Um, and well, outside of Australia, um, ETO LCD has been now used by the subcontractors of the project HS2 um, to help to measure uh, CO2 and, and also to decarbonize such a huge project. 
So um, HS2 first committed to 50% uh, carbon reduction um, and then recently took it to a whole new level and committed to net zero by 2035. But um, I would uh, stop from here and uh, pass it on to Mark to talk more about the HS2 and uh, the program uh, in more detail. Okay, over to you, Mark. I'll, um, I'll let you present now. Thanks, Mario. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Um, great to be here today. So, thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Fenton. I'm Carbon Manager at High Speed 2. Um, and I lead the carbon management and reduction activities, net zero activities for Britain's new high speed railway. So I'll just start with a bit of an introduction to what HS2 is. Um, so HS2 is high speed two, it's the new high speed railway that will form the backbone of Britain's transport network. This Europe's biggest infrastructure project it involves 345 miles of brand new high speed track. And HS2 Limited was set up by the UK's Department for Transport with a mandate to develop and promote the UK's new high-speed network. So over the last um, decade, we've been designing the railway, consulting and seeking the powers through Parliament to begin construction. And the construction of the new railway is split into three phases. So there's phase one that links London with the West Midlands, and we received parliamentary approval for phase one of the railway um, back in 2017. And um, our main civil construction is well underway now. Phase 2A links the West Midlands um, and the North via crew, and we received, received approval from Parliament in February 2021. I know the work have begun, including environmental and ground investigations. Phase 2B completes the railway uh, to Manchester, the East Midlands and the North, and we submitted a, it's called a hybrid bill, to Parliament in January of this year, seeking consent to construct and operate Phase 2B. It's part of an integrated network, so it's a new railway, but integrates with the existing rail network. So HS2 trains will also run on, on the existing network, serving towns and cities in the northwest, the northeast, and Scotland. And HS2 will connect um, about 30 million people and eight of our largest cities with 25 stops from Scotland to the southeast of England. And the current plans are for phase one to begin operation between Birmingham and uh, London between 2029 and 2033, and for the full network to be open and complete by 2040. So I just wanted to highlight some of the um, contractors and consultants that are working on the programme. This is just a selection of uh, some of our headline tier one contracts. We won't go through all of these, but there are perhaps some names that you recognise there. The likes of Jacobs, Bechtel is our de uh, delivery partners for phase one and phase two B. Um, lots of the consulting um, organizations, ACOM, Atkins, Arup, WSP, and then some big, uh, really big construction joint ventures um, from Europe and the UK. Uh, and as I say, this is just a selection of, of some of our contractors and um, you'll see there's a, already a long list there and lots of parties involved in delivering. This is just phase one. Um, so the supply chain is only going to grow as phase 2A and 2B uh, start to be delivered in earnest. Uh, just briefly again on why we need, why Britain needs HS2. So HS2 is designed to address three key problems facing the nation. So our railways are overcrowded and they desperately need more capacity. Our economy is unbalanced with focus needed in the Midlands and the North. And as we're all aware, our climate is changing and a huge part of working towards um, a low carbon economy or a net zero carbon economy will involve decarbonizing our transport network. And HST will provide more capacity, cut carbon emissions and deliver better connectivity. So I've talked about um, the what and the why of HS2, but our success will be measured not just on what we build, but also on how we deliver it. And that's why the programme has always been about more than just a railway. Um, so we're committed to delivering value for money. We have a responsibility to make sure that every pound that we spend delivers benefits to people. And we've set a, 
us, um, we've developed, developed a set of strategic goals that help us to focus on the benefits that we're promising to realize. So they include the objectives on being a catalyst for economic growth, increasing capacity and connectivity, but they also include efforts to ensure that we create jobs for British companies, protect and preserve the environment, set world-class standards for health and safety, making sure that we treat the local economies, uh, local communities who will host our infrastructure with respect and sensitivity to their concerns. And carbon reduction is one of our strategic objectives. And all of our suppliers are and will continue to be signed up to helping us deliver on these goals. And we'll hold them to account for what they deliver and the way that they behave. So as I say, reducing carbon is one of our strategic objectives. Um, and to reduce the carbon footprint, we first need to understand our whole life carbon impacts um, so that we can identify the carbon hotspots and that those being the areas with the greatest impact and therefore the uh, greatest potential for carbon reduction. So we've been regularly assessing the carbon impact of the scheme, whether that's been part of route appraisals, impact assessments, or design development. And we have a, a very good understanding of the program's carbon footprint. And this slide summarizes the whole life carbon footprint for phase one of HS2. So that's the leg that is being constructed currently from London to Birmingham. And what you can see is that almost half of the carbon footprint is associated with the construction materials themselves. And that's largely concrete and steel and cement specifically within concrete that's driving that impact. But when you then look at the transport and the, the construction installation, combine that with the construction materials, you can see that almost 75% of the carbon impact is in that construction stage. Then have a further 13% of maintenance and replacement, and this is over a 120 year appraisal period, with the remaining carbon emissions being associated with operational energy to power our trains, roll, um, stations, depots, and infrastructure. So, carbon reduction it isn't a new requirement for HS2, it's fundamental to our purpose, and we therefore need to make sure that carbon reduction is informing decision making throughout the development and delivery of the program and part of how we do that is by building clear and effective carbon controls into our delivery processes and embedding carbon management best practice and we do that through implementation of our sector leading carbon management system so this slide summarizes the key components of our carbon management system and it's been accredited by LRQA, Lloyd's Register Quality Assurance, to the industry best practice standard for carbon management called PAS 2080. So that's a publicly available specification 2080, and it's called carbon management um, in infrastructure. So we were only the second client organization globally to achieve accreditation to this standard. Um, and as part of our commitment to manage and minimize carbon emissions, we've adopted ambitious carbon reduction targets that so, so Mario mentioned. Uh, so phase one and 2A, um, the civil stations and the rail systems, they're all required to achieve at least a 50% reduction in whole life carbon emissions when they are delivering those assets. And we'll be setting further carbon reduction targets for phase 2B once approved, uh, once the scheme's approved in Parliament. And we monitor we measure carbon reduction performance using life cycle assessment and specifically using eTool life cycle design and some of the reasons that we partnered with eTool um, are that it is a design tool as maria mentioned um, it's in the hands of those who actively are making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis about the design process it facilitates collaboration and um, which as i say the number of partners that we have involved in our supply chain is, is really critical to carbon reduction. It's web-based, so we can make it accessible to all of our supply chain or the relevant parts that, that need access to it. It's a whole life carbon um, tool, so it looks at the full life cycle impact. And actually it does more than just carbon. So whilst I'm interested in the carbon quantification, it also looks at other environmental indicators which supports our wider sustainability objectives. Um, we also feel it's, that it's scientifically scientifically rigorous, so we have to um, comply with BREEAM, the Building Research Establishment's Environmental Assessment Method, and SQL, 
um, and ETO supports us with those objectives as well. And as Maria alluded to earlier, um, we have some strict information management BIM requirements. We have lots and lots of data. So the um, bulk upload functionality that we've been able to develop links with um, the design software, so Revit, Autodesk, the like, and um, that's really helpful for us as well. Um, so we do measure and quantify the carbon footprint at regular intervals. Um, that allows us to monitor performance against our reduction targets and establish the baselines against which those targets are measured. We've also integrated carbon reduction as a key performance indicator into our performance measurement cycle uh, and the associated governance and reporting regimes. So that makes the collection of carbon data um, proactive. We, we recognize that reducing carbon is as much about changing behaviors as it is about changing processes. So we're well aware that we need to build and raise awareness, build capability, motivate action to deliver lower carbon solutions. And as part of that, we've been building uh, carbon reduction into our procurement processes so that suppliers are on board um, and we have common objectives. Uh, we've also been uh, developing and rolling out a package of carbon literacy learning um, across our business, starting with our executive and board um, so that they understand what carbon reduction is about. And we're a carbon literate organization, um, bronze accredited, uh, and seeking to be silver accredited later this year. So, as I say, we have a 50% reduction target. Um, by March of last year, we'd achieved a 25% reduction in carbon emissions across phase one. I just wanted to share some practical, tangible examples of how that's been achieved. So this slide shows some of the actions that our colleagues in the SES joint venture, who are delivering the civil infrastructure from Euston Station in London to Old Oak Common, which is in West London. So this is just some of the solutions that they've implemented and intend to implement uh, and shows their respective carbon impact. Uh, there's obviously a lot of detail in here. I guess it just illustrates that there isn't a silver bullet. There are lots of things that need to be done um, to deliver substantial carbon reduction. But just some examples, um, they've adopted build nothing solution. So they've managed to design out some assets uh, and they've done that by working with the tunnel ventilation specialists, for example, to Im improve their designs, which has allowed them to reduce the number of shafts and optimize the shaft design. They've built less with the shaft uh, optimization there as well. Uh, they've been able to harmonize the diameter of their tunnels, which has meant, meant that they've needed fewer tunnel borrow machines as well. And then through the detailed design, they'll be looking at build clever and build efficiently solutions. So concrete and steel are gonna be key areas for carbon reduction. So they'll be looking at optimizing concrete mix, in particular, the opportunity to use low carbon concrete and cement replacements and reuse steel or steel that has um, a high recycle content. And then they're also proc procuring uh, zero carbon electricity to power the tunnel borrowing machines and uh, looking to eliminate fossil diesel from their construction sites. So hopefully in the next few weeks, they'll have their first diesel free construction sites live um, to, to promote. So just a bit of a summary on the journey so far. Um, so we are, we, we have the right processes in place. Um, our work to cut carbon emissions is well underway. We have the right processes, systems, and tools in place. These have been independently verified as being in accordance with carbon management best practice. We're a carbon literate organization, and we provide our colleagues with knowledge, motivation, and ability to take carbon reduction action. And substantial carbon reduction is already being achieved, um, and we're making good progress against our targets. But we want and we need to do more. So we have a responsibility and a unique opportunity to play a significant role in the collective endeavor to combat the climate emergency. And that's why we launched our Net Zero Carbon Plan. So the plan was launched um, at the start of the year in January. And the plan explains the work that we've undertaken to date, what we're doing now, and it also maps the progress that we intend to make in the years ahead on our journey towards destination net zero uh, by 2035. 
So the plan lays actions to become a net zero carbon business by 2025. So we're talking specifically there about our scope one and two carbon emissions associated with our offices largely. Um, but then we, we um, are aiming to achieve net zero carbon construction and operation from 2035. And what we mean by that is that we'll reduce emissions from construction, operation and maintenance as far as possible. And from 2035, we'll offset residual carbon emissions that we can't eliminate as we build, maintain and operate HS2. So the plan also looks at um, the ways that will influence the wider construction and manufacturing industries to create a, a cleaner, greener future as well. And we have some stepping stones on the way to our 2035 net zero objective. So as I say, by 2025, we intend to be a net zero carbon business. Um, in the next few weeks, we'll be introducing our first diesel free construction site with the aim of eliminating fossil diesel on all construction sites by 2029. We have our 50% reduction target still in place to achieve that by 2030. But in addition, we have new targets for achieving a 50% reduction in carbon emissions from the production of concrete and steel, and to achieve that by 2030 compared to 2021 levels. Also targeting um, heavy goods vehicles, so reducing the carbon intensity of HGV movements by 11% by 2017, uh, 2027 rather, compared to 2020. And we're committed to using 100% zero carbon electricity to power our trains, stations, depots, and infrastructure that will make journeys on HS2 zero carbon from uh, day one of operation. And then, as I say, from 2035, we'll offset residual emissions that we can't eliminate. And to support these targets and actions, we've identified four areas that will um, be critical in delivering our ambition. So they're people, partnerships, innovation, and governance. And in terms of people, so all of our staff and our supply chain partners can play a, a key role in HS2 achieving the net zero carbon objectives. So we're aiming to build a culture in which people think about ways to cut emissions and will support new initiatives that allow us to hit our carbon targets. Um, a commitment to net zero will be a condition of winning work on HS2. Uh, that will make sure that our supply chain objectives are in line with our net zero carbon objectives and will link net zero carbon to the performance of individuals and organizations. And then, of course, we'll celebrate success in combating climate change. Partnerships. Um, so the move to net zero does require a collective endeavor, and we recognize the importance of collaboration, particularly with our peers and our supply chain partners. So we're working with industry groups, peers, supply chain partners, and key stakeholders, stakeholders to make sure that our efforts are aligned, that they're effective, and that they inspire action. We'll communicate our net zero carbon targets to stakeholders, be clear about how we'll, we can work together, and with the aim of using our net zero carbon plan as a catalyst to speed up the wider industry's transition to net zero. A key part of that is sharing best practice and lessons learned in the wider construction sector, using our influence to encourage others to take action to tackle climate change. So we've already started our learning legacy, um, and you can find that by searching HS2 Learning Legacy in your search engine. And with that, we aim to uh, promote best practice, ensure that that success is then replicated across the industry uh, with the aim of supporting UK manufacturing and construction sectors to become net zero. And innovation, that'll be really critical as well. So many of the solutions that will allow us to move to net zero already exist, but there are barriers that are stopping them from being used. So this, that means that there's still lots of ways we can innovate and we need to continually explore new technologies. So we're investing in innovation, forming partnerships to speed up ways to cut emissions in HS2 supply chain. We'll support innovation in fuel switching technologies, first of a kind demonstration, research into advanced technologies and advances in product innovation and we'll be setting new standards for carbon best practice creating the culture and the commercial conditions in which innovation can thrive piloting new ideas to make sure that they work and allow standards and specifications to be challenged and then finally on, on governance so our net zero carbon plan is owned at an executive level by our chief executive officer the HS2 Limited Board is responsible for making sure that we achieve our targets 
and oversight is provided by the Environmental Sustainability Committee, which is a subcommittee of HST Limited's board. So our net zero carbon objectives, they'll be incorporated into our existing environmental uh, sustainability frameworks and policies. We're refining our governance arrangements to, to better integrate carbon into decision making. And we're using governance to raise awareness, drive carbon reduction performance, and ensure that net zero carbon decision making, reporting, and risk management is efficient and effective. And then we'll be held accountable through our annual reports um, to the public and to various stakeholders. So there's some quick links there to a selection of the, the documents I've referred to, the net zero carbon plan, a short video that summarizes our net zero carbon plan. Um, and you can also take a, a, a tour of Birmingham Interchange Station, a virtual tour, which is one of the world's most environmentally friendly stations. Um, so that just leaves me to thank you for your time. Um, happy to take any questions. And uh, if you want to stay in touch, there's all of our social media channels and um, lots more information on our web page as well. Amazing. Thank you so much, Mark. This is really, really informative. Very good. I've learned a lot today as well myself. So, yeah, amazing. Um, yeah, well, uh, I hope that if anyone has some questions, um, I'll just check quickly in our polls. And, um, if uh, no one does, then um, I'm I certainly have a few. Sure. <laughs> Share my screen as well. Here we go. We've got one question from Finn. How did they create the baseline? Yes, so that was not um, not a straightforward task for us because we are a uh, what I refer to as as a pop up client. So before sort of two thousand and nine, we didn't exist. We don't have uh, any existing assets. We don't have a is a historical inventory of data. Um, so what we, our preference would have been to look at that historical uh, inventory, use that to build up, to create benchmarks um, and to create our baselines. Um, we, we didn't have that data, as I say, so we, we engaged with um, some of our peers, so national highways who look after the strategic road network, network rail who look after the existing rail network, um, to understand what carbon data they had. Um, they had various bits of data, but perhaps not a, a complete and comprehensive um, set of data or a bit patchy. Um, so essentially, didn't have the, we weren't able to use their benchmark data. Um, and the reality was when we looked internationally, there wasn't good quality benchmark data available either. So this is sort of back in 2016 that we were trying to do this process. So where we ended up in the end um, was working with the supply chain. So they have the history of building bridges, tunnels, viaducts, embankments. Um, so they, we worked with them. They provided the essentially the activity data, so the quantities. We have well-defined rules for and standards for how life cycle assessment should be conducted. Um, and it's lots of data quality rules that align with the international standards. So BSEN 15804, ISO 14044. Um, and with a lot of collaborative work, um, we've, we've managed to establish some, what we think are credible, robust baseline positions um, that allow us to report carbon reduction performance going forward. Um, they also are representative. So one of the key principles of the baselines is that they're representative of current industry practice. So current as of when the baselines were produced. So that we're, we're the 50% reduction has been measured against what would, what would be standard practice. So we do have a, um, a learning legacy paper about the baselines and the process that we went through to do that. Um, so again, if you search HS2 learning legacy, that should then take you to the, the portal. And if you search um, carbon baselines in that portal, that will bring up the paper that we authored. So there's lots of lessons learned in there, uh, description of the process that we went through um, 
but a key, a key part of it was that we had to work really collaboratively with our supply chain. There was a good amount of client-led assurance that was done on top of those that collaborative work as well. It was time intensive, um, but the the industry is moving along very rapidly. Etool uh, increasingly has uh, more data in it, for example, as well that we can use as baselines. Um, there are other platforms and portals uh, in in the UK. We we have a built environment carbon database, which is about to be launched, which will be a hub for um, benchmark data, essentially. Uh, and the Department for Transport, our sponsor, is also looking at how they can better collate um, data from HS2, from Network Rail, National Highways, and its other arm's length bodies, so that it can have a better insight into the sort of benchmarks and carbon impact of its portfolio. So it's, there's a lot of promise there. And of course, when HS2 is built, we'll have lots of as-built um, data that we're looking forward to be able to share with people and to make it a less painful process of producing those baselines. Yeah, great, great. Thanks, Mark. Um, I think many, yeah, many organisations and projects really struggle to find uh, the right starting point as well in Australia. Here, I heard a few companies talking about this. So it's really good to, that you provided this insight. Um, I've got a, a relevant question to that as well uh, from Sandra from What McDonald. Um, what advice do you have for those starting out on their net zero journey? Um, I guess one of the biggest bits of advice, um, don't expect or pretend to have all of the answers um, and don't let the absence of uh, having all of the answers stop you from starting on the journey. Um, so we've been very clear in our engagement with um, our board and our sponsor that net zero is the right um, direction of travel. We as a organization need to take a leadership position. We're a unique program. Um, we have an opportunity to influence uh, the, the UK construction sector that not many programs of work do. Um, so once we'd agreed the principle that we did want to take a leadership position on this, um, that then meant for us that the UK is committed to net zero by 2050, um, but a leader can't just adopt a, a 2050 date. So it was a case of what date do we pick? We went with 2035 and we did that by looking at what our peers are doing and what others are doing and how we might be able to work with them to accelerate um, net zero and low zero carbon solutions so that then gave us the confidence that 2035 was a reasonable date um, we accepted this it's really challenging nonetheless um, and we certainly we have a, a broad route map um, that includes some technological innovations but then is also as much about cultural innovation as well and behavior change and that will get us a long way um, it might not get us to 2035 net zero um, but if we don't start now, we're definitely not going to get to net zero anytime soon. So that that really is the key learning, and and it's it's challenging to get people on side with that when they all want to know how much is this is going to cost, and your answer is well, I don't know because I don't actually have all of the the solutions for for getting to net zero right now anyway. Um, but we are we're confident that uh, the scale of HS2, the opportunity that we have to collaborate with peers in the supply chain, that we can mitigate cost risks and that we can um, accelerate and advance low and uh, zero carbon solutions quickly and more cost effectively as well. Yeah, just um, getting connecting the dots here. Um, again, another question from Sandra here. How much did HS2 prescribe the net zero solutions versus allowing the contractors and supply chain to come up with them? Yeah, so that's, um, <laughs> yeah, and it's, it, there's, Two arguments to this, but there's um, the the approach that we've adopted is to just be outcome based in our requirements. So we started off with our 50% reduction target, um, which is actually whilst it's described as a target, it was a it's a requirement of the contract. Um, so that's outcome based. Um, we don't particularly care how they get to that 50%. Um, they can do it by using low carbon concrete, low carbon steel. Um, zero emission fleets, uh, designing out materials, uh, using 
modular construction, whatever they like, um, as long as they apply the carbon reduction hierarchy and that their claims are credible, robust, and backed up by scientific data, um, we, we assure all of that and make sure that they're um, being honest in, in their claims. Um, so that's, that's the approach that we've adopted is to be outcome based. Um, but then there are some areas where perhaps we there's a, a benefit to being more uh, prescriptive on direction of travel. So concrete is an example. Um, I think the 2012 Olympics, for example, in London, I think they prescribed a minimum cement replacement um, for concrete. And you can do the same for recycled content in steel. As I say, to date, we haven't adopted that because there's the potential perverse outcomes. So things like recycle content, as soon as you start to specify that, there is a risk that you actually introduce carbon into the scheme because people have to travel further to get that recycled aggregate. And that um, outweighs the benefit of using recycled aggregate in the first place. So we've tried, we've tried to use outcome-based um, requirements, given the supply chain, the flexibility to respond, to adopt innovation, uh, and to adopt the most cost-effective pathway. Um, and that's true still with our net zero carbon targets, is that whilst we're saying we want a 11% in emissions from HGVs, we're not saying that they have to be hydrogen uh, or electric or hybrid. It's, we just want an 11% reduction in emissions. And again, for concrete and steel, we want 50% reduction in the emissions from the production of those materials. Um, but it's up to the suppliers, whether that's about energy efficiency of their um, operations, whether it's about introducing renewable energy into how they produce their products, um, or if it's about alternative um, cements, uh, higher recycled content of steel, etc. So we've, we've, we've tried to leave the expert um, to define the, the most cost effective solutions. Okay, thank you. Um, on diesel, um, I've got a question from Imad from CPV. Um, if Mike could please share some initiatives on how to achieve diesel-free construction site by 2029. Yeah, so that's um, a lot of this work is actually being led by my colleague uh, colleagues in the, the air quality agenda. But um, I mean, as I say, SES Joint Venture, who are working on phase one, there in the next few days or weeks, um, they'll be launching their first diesel-free construction site. Um, so electrification of, of plants um, is a key part of how they're doing that, being connected to the grid. Um, they're fortunate in that their work sites are in and around London, so lots of opportunity to connect to the grid. Um, we have contractors who are working in more rural areas and connecting to the grid is more of a challenge. So in those instances, we're looking at um, battery solutions, hybrid solutions, um, hydrogen fuel cell solutions as well. Um, and of course, the, the first thing that we want to do more generally anyway is just to reduce the amount of stuff that's moving around. So uh, consolidation centers, um, earthworks is a big part of our carbon footprints uh, and that's it's just diesel from moving earth around. So really optimizing uh, the cut and fill balance, trying to reduce the amount that we're cutting and, uh, and the amount that we have to fill. Um, we have an innovation program, as, as I mentioned, so we're looking at some um, well, various solutions, electric cranes, electric diggers, um, then more strategically also looking at um, what our role is to support um, provision of hydrogen infrastructure. So it's one thing to have a few hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, but we also need to make sure that the, the infrastructure more generally is, is provided so that it, the scale uh, so that we can scale up on that solution. So we're, we're working across our innovation program to understand what we need to do there. Um, and then it's also just in the last few weeks, it's our intention um, to introduce a sort of labeling scheme across our um, construction sites. Um, so looking at if they've removed diesel from their, their sites, then they might get silver accreditation. Um, if they're if they're connected to the grids, gold, platinum awards. So trying to create some sort of friendly competition between construction sites 
to improve performance, create that incentive, and also reward and recognize those who are going above and beyond um, what is re uh, required of them contractually. So a few behavioral things, turning off the, um, the equipment is still a big opportunity, just stop them idling. Uh, and it's amazing how much diesel you can reduce just by turning them off. Yeah, that's true. Um, thanks for it. I, yeah, I was uh, also interested how to get to digital free construction site. It sounds like a mission impossible, but the whole net zero sounds also like a mission impossible net <laughs> today. And it's amazing to see how HS2 is challenging, yeah, the uh, contractors and suppliers and the whole supply chain and, you know, working together collaboratively with everyone um, to achieve that. It's, it's really yeah, quite mind blowing, to be honest. <laughs> Um, I've got a, one more question from Simon um, from Perspective. Thank you for the presentation, Mark. Do you observe LCA information uh, being used regularly to assess design options? And is LCA information used as key input into decision making? Um, so I think short answer is yes on, on both accounts, um, though there is room for improvement. Um, so Carbon reduction and carbon management information has been used throughout the development and delivery of, of HS2. So carbon's always been one of the core principles, or carbon reduction's always been one of the core principles. There's um, still a challenge for that metric to be held up alongside cost and schedule as important metrics for the program. But that's one of the key things that we're trying to do with net zero and the net, the net zero plan is to make carbon a metric on the same playing field as schedule, cost, health and safety. Um, and the same is true with, with our biodiversity, no net loss metric as well. So trying to really elevate them so that they're on a par with cost and schedule. Um, in terms of the life cycle assessment on a more day-to-day -day basis, um, because we have our 50% reduction requirements, that creates an urgency, creates a, um, a driver or life cycle assessment to, to occur on a regular basis. Um, it, it doesn't always have to happen in the prescribed tool that we have, so our e-tool. Um, the most important thing often, so we absolutely want the data in e-tool when it's been reported back to us. Um, but a number of our supply chain colleagues have um, their own tools or uh, bridges, for example, they through their Institute, the iStruct E, they have a tool that supports them in bridge design, which is really, really quick and easy to use as well. Um, so we don't mind if they use that as long as they're, in, as long as that data is then informing decision making. If that allows them to use, uh, to to adopt the low carbon solution, um, we're quite happy for that to happen, as long as the data is ultimately integrated into, into eTool. Um, and that said, eTool gives us that capability for the, the designers to optimize their designs as well, uh, linking into um, Autodesk and the other CAD-based models. Um, so I think yes is the, the short answer for, for both of those. But we can always do more. It can always be uh, better automated, made more visible. Um, and we have some big plans to do that in HS2 in terms of um, turning the outputs from eTool into our digital twin so that everybody has access to that data and that it's it's meaningful to them and can um, spark the right types of conversations about reducing carbon and getting to net zero and make it more inclusive so that it's not just me and a handful of other people that really understand the data and um, how it's been generated, what it means, because I'm, I'm not designing anything, I'm not delivering anything, I'm here to enable other people to make the right net zero carbon decisions. Yeah, that, that's great, great for yeah, you mentioning that sharing is caring and information shared is very important these days for everyone to learn. We don't have time to compete, right? Um, although it's important as well to drive the innovation. I've got another question on from um, Renault from the Transport of New South Wales. As a proponent, how do you ensure your performance targets do not stifle innovation? 
Yeah, so that that was the main reason we've adopted the outcome-based requirements approach. Um, I mean, when we were setting these requirements back in sort of 2015, knowing that the scheme wasn't going to open until the back end of 2020 or 2030. So it would have been, in the absence of a crystal ball, um, it would have been impossible for me really to specify what the right solution was for anything, even concrete. What is the right cement replacement? What we did in 2012 at the Olympics, is that still going to be acceptable um, in the 2020s? So that that's why we've adopted outcome-based, is to give the flexibility um, to the contractors. Um, it's also part of the way that we mitigate cost risk as well, um, because as soon as we specify something that can can create monopolies or it can certainly create a direction of travel. Um, so GGBS, as an example, is a, a cement replacement in Europe. There's already a big shortage of that um, with some of our contractors saying that they're, they're not going to be able to get the shipments that they were anticipating. So again, if we'd specified that GGBS had to be used as a cement replacement, then we might have ended up in a, a bit of a difficult position, um, either not getting what we need or um, getting it at an inflated price. And the reality of it is anyway that if we get the, the cement replacement, it just means that somebody else doesn't. So it doesn't actually make a, a difference at a national or international level. It just means that HS2 gets to shout about our carbon reduction. So we we really wanted to, to be able to support meaningful carbon reduction, both at a, a programme level, a national level and a international level, um, whilst also mitigating cost impacts and promoting and supporting innovation. Nice one. Um, thanks, Mark. Another question from uh, Liam uh, from Lot McDonald as well. Does the ETL platform support optioneering between alternative decarbonization pathways, example, design options, timescale options? If yes, what were the key pathway options for HS2 and how did you decide on your final roadmap? Yes, so yeah, ETL does allow you to do that. We haven't used ETL um, to produce our roadmap for, for net zero. Um, the way it's been used is that our supply chain partners um, are using it in the design and delivery of their schemes. Um, so that's how we intend to continue using ETOOL is with our out -based, outcome based requirements set um, saying you'll be delivering this piece of work or this part of the network or these assets um, and effectively don't mind how you do it. Um, except for these constraints on cost and schedule and health and safety and other things. Um, but you can deliver that work. And as long as it has a 50% reduction in carbon emissions, um, as long as it's energy efficient, as long as it's um, the concrete and steel that you're using has 50% fewer emissions per, per ton of product, um, it's up to them to, to work that out. How we um, arrived at concrete steel and diesel as being the, the areas that we need to focus was looking at the outputs from eTool and other um, assessment uh, tools as well. And concrete and steel account for about 80% of our product carbon emissions. Um, so if we don't do anything with those two products, then we're not going to get anywhere near to net zero. And as I say, the amount of um, the other thing that drives the carbon footprint, um, noting that 75% of the carbon footprint is in construction, is diesel the moving stuff to site, so the A4 transport emissions, and diesel moving stuff within the site, so particularly the excavated material um, and, and mass haul. So again, yeah, if we don't um, address diesel consumption and look for alternatives, then we were never going to get close to net zero. And it might be that we need to introduce um, other targets in the future as well. It's, it's likely that we, we will. Um, whether that's on asphalt, other products um, will be moving from a civil engineering to a rail systems delivery organization in the in sort of the next few years or with more of a focus on those and the precious metals and um, products that come along with that. Um, 
so we'll, we'll continue to look at the data that comes out of ETL and use that to guide our, our thinking and our processes for, for net zero. Amazing, thank you. Um, also, have a question from Kerry uh, from Aricon. How are the offsets uh, going to be chosen to ensure appropriate long-term offset with limited vulnerability? Yeah, so uh, offsetting up until January, um, we didn't have a policy position on on offsetting, so it was, it was actually actively um, silent on it. Um, in our previous policy, so we weren't pursuing offsets in any in any way. So this is a real policy move for us, and the offsetting strategy at the moment is a is a blank piece of paper. Um, but we have lots of good guidance that we can work from. So the Environment Agency here in in the UK, uh, they've done a, a lot of research on um, different types of offsetting from different land use types and nature based solutions. So that's a really good bit of, of research and literature review that will inform our approach. Um, we also have the Oxford Principles for Carbon Offsetting that set out lots of uh, requirements and guidance on ensuring permanence, additionality, um, that you're delivering wider social, environmental and economic benefits. Um, and then also things like the gold standards, um, science-based targets initiatives has guidance on offsetting as well. So, that it's it's through implementing best practice effectively is how we're going to ensure that we have a, a credible offsetting strategy that is, ensures that we're um we, we have the additionality that we need that we have the permanence that we need that they are good quality offsets and that they're driving beneficial outcomes both from a carbon perspective but also uh, biodiversity and social and all of those other benefits that can come with um offsetting I guess the other thing is we're looking at insetting as well as an option, which equally we're at a blank piece of paper for that as well. Uh, but our intention is working with uh, the Institute of Civil Engineers, other partners, um, again, Network Rail, National Highways, big landowners in the UK, uh, looking at how we might be able to adopt a, a collective and common approach to carbon offsetting, um, working with DFTR sponsor and DEFRA, the Department for Environment as well. Amazing. Um, another question on uh, the targets uh, from Kerry as well. Uh, where did the drive for the target start? Um, was it government level mandate? How can consultants assist our clients realize the opportunities and embrace bold targets? Um, it wasn't government as such. So um, it, infrastructure in the UK isn't a sector in our carbon budget. So we have energy sector, transport sector. Um, but then we don't have sort of construction and, and infrastructure delivery sort of gets falls between the gaps and it's also not part of our territorial emissions. But what we do have um, is good working relationships between infrastructure client organisations and uh, a link into government. So the, the carbon reduction target was actually a client led activity. So the infrastructure client group, um, which HS2 is part of, amongst others, the Environment Agency, Network Rail, National Highways, loads of other companies, uh, client organisations. They all agreed that we needed to have a common approach to carbon reduction. Um, we needed it would benefit the supply chain if we had a common target, so that they could all respond in the same way, and we didn't add a burden to our supply chain partners. Um, so it was through that forum that we agreed that. Um, the initial target was 30% by 2025 and 50% by 2030. So those are the targets that we've adopted. Uh, the 50% reduction by 2030 is aligned with um, the guidance that came out from the Climate Change Committee as part of the fourth or fifth carbon budget advice to government. So there is reasons for that. And then there is also a, a joint industry and government construct uh, construction 2025 strategy which aim to reduce emissions by 50%, deliver um, projects at lower cost, I think it was 33% lower cost more quickly and with greater export potential as well. So it is led by the client organizations aligning with some of the science and um, strategy that existed at the time. Yeah, well, I think we would go on a lot on uh, and ask you questions. Uh, who's a very knowledgeable person, and um, I'm sure um, 
people in Australia and in New Zealand uh, have learned uh, a lot today from you um, and from such an inspiring project. Um, but yeah, if, if you guys have more questions, feel free to shoot us an email and we'll, uh, we'll, ask, we'll answer them um, offline. But yeah, thank you so much for everyone for joining and uh, special thank you for Mark. Thanks for no your early morning and um, joining in. I uh, really appreciate it and um, have everyone have a good day and chat to you soon.